I want to talk about the medical profession because yeah. herein, you know, lie the greatest irony. These people who are dispatched with, you know, tending to our health um, have this, you know, complete myopic perspective when it comes to prioritizing sleep in their own profession. And there's this um, systemic, you know, kind of infrastructure set up that prioritizes lack of sleep. These residents who have to work these 30 hour shifts, this legacy of an old tradition that was set in stone long ago and continues like unbelievably to, you know, be the standard operating procedure today, which That's is right. unbelievable. And I loved how you told the history of this, this guy Halstead, right? Yeah. <laughs> who, who basically was a hard ass back in the, at the turn of the century and just said, this is the way we're gonna do it. And today we still do it in the manner that, that, that he kind of established back then, but it turns out he was like a raging cocaine addict. That's right, yeah. Right? So William <laughs> Halstead was the guy who set yeah. up the, uh, the, resident, the first uh -huh. resident uh, training program in the United States um, at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and you know, it's called a residency for a reason because you're going to become a resident. You're going to live in the mm -hmm. hospital. Right. And he was known for being able to go these heroic long stretches without needing sleep. People were stunned and he expected his junior residents to match him in that. Uh -huh. And gradually after his death, it emerged the reason why he was able to do that. Holstead in his early career was actually studying um, the anesthetic properties of cocaine. And unfortunately he started to use cocaine himself and he, become an, he became uh, an accidental addict. And that was how he was able to just go days straight right. without seemingly you know, needing sleep. So and apparently set the expectation that everybody else should be able to should match manage to, to, it the yeah, way that he was. To go right. the same degree. Now, there were times, there were stories where people would say, you know, he would in the operating theater, he would have to go and take a break because he was saying he was not feeling well. He was sweating a lot. He seemed to be cold and he would have to go take a break. And, you know, it was because right. he was <laughs> detoxing during the long uh, surgery. Uh -huh. So he had to go and administer again. Um, and there were even stories. So he knew that he was an addict and he sought to go into rehab under a, a different uh, surname. And at the time they were treating cocaine addiction with morphine. Right. And unfortunately what happened is that he came out of that rehabilitation program with no resolution to his cocaine addiction, but now he had a heroin addiction. Right. And the story goes that he would, you know, have his shirts, his white shirts sent away to get laundered in places like Paris, you know, France, and they would come back both white and starchy, but there would also be other, right. you know, white <laughs> related God compounds uh, in there. So, and we've never let go of that, you know, arcane mm -hmm. and I think inane practice. And it's not medical residents who are at fault here. You know, you speak to any of them and none of them will tell you that that's what I want to be doing. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I've had conversations with a dear friend called Peter Atia, who is, who went through the medical practice, he's a wonderful medical doctor. Um, and he describes, you know, some shocking history mm. with a lack of sleep. And the statistics are just damning. Firstly, what we know is that medical residents who have performed a 30 hour shift will make 460% more diagnostic errors in the intensive care unit. Secondly, we know that if you're going to have elective surgery, let's say, and your surgeon has slept less than six hours in the previous 24, they're 170% more likely to cause a major surgical error, such as rupturing a blood vessel or you know, damaging or puncturing an organ. Then the irony is that a medical resident who's worked a 30 hour shift, when they get back in their car to drive home at the end of their shift, they're 168% more likely to get into a car crash. Now, returning to the accident and emergency room from which they probably came, but now as a patient mm. rather than a doctor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've tried with many other people to lobby the medical institute um, and, or institution and try to understand why, why is this the case? And I think some of it has to do with the old boys network that it's almost like a hazing that, you know, yeah, we went through it, we so it. you have to do it, mm -hmm. you know, you know, man up, suit up, boot up, woman up, you know, you, 
you need to get through this. This is a rites of passage. And again, it comes back to that idea that thinking that you can fight mother nature and evolution is mm-hmm. just thick headed. And that's what this just yeah. I mean, demonstrates. I, I, to I us. get the idea that you have to develop a level of rigor and emotional resiliency to handle that kind of job. And there is something to be said for, you know, putting people in challenging situations to see how they uh, function under high stress. But the sleep deprivation aspect of it is just ridiculous. You know, if, if you, when you go through medical school, you know, you take an oath which is to do no harm. And then you're placed under conditions of insufficient sleep that statistically mm-hmm. will guarantee that you will do more harm than if you were sleeping or working, let's say just a 16 hour shift. Yeah. You know, and one of the push, I think some of the pushback that you receive or I've received is look, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the data. Right. <laughs> and you think, okay. Right. Uh, what, you're what the can, doc, what, you're what, the scientist. What, what can I you're do? You're the doctors. You know, you, yeah. isn't this self-evident? And one of the arguments though, I think that has some legitimacy is that of continuity of care, that if you are flip-flopping back and forth mm-hmm. between a resident every six yeah, hours, I get that. the continuity of the patient care can decrease. But then I, I, I thought about that argument for a long time. And then I looked at um, a number of medical, uh, country, or sorry, the medical systems throughout the world. And I asked, how long does it take to train their residents and how good is their medical care? And what I found is that there are places like New Zealand, uh, France, Switzerland, they all have their residents working no more than 16 hours. And their quality of healthcare is is actually ranks Mm. far better Mm. in the worldwide statistics than the United States. Mm. So you can't tell me that you can't train an individual within five years or less at a reasonable amount of sleep and not maintain high quality of medical practice. Right. Well, part of the problem tracks back to the fact that there's no education on this in medical school, right? So these doctors who then become (laughs) hospital administrators don't have the proper background to make a better decision about this. That's exactly right. So I I also, you know, myself and some other researchers, um, you look at the medical curriculum throughout many of these uh, world, first world nations. And what you discover is that on average, the average medical resident will receive somewhere between an hour and a half to two hours Mm -hmm. of education on sleep relative to the entire medical program. Now that strikes me because that's one third of their patients' lives and that one third of their life spent asleep makes a profound difference to their two thirds of waking health life why aren't we investing more in the education of sleep for our medical residents? Well, why aren't we? Uh, Have you seen since the book came out and you've been, you know, speaking regularly on this, have you seen changes, positive movement in this regard? A little, but not not too much, uh, unfortunately. I think there are some medical programs around this country, at least that are doing better than others. Um, There's a, a quite a variability So some are are prioritizing it and understanding its importance. But overall, no, I think that Mm -hmm. that same sort of some of that hubris um, is still present. Um, What do we do to change that? Well, you know, I tried early on speaking about this from the statistics of the patients, from a point of view of compassion and empathy for our young residents. And that sort of just falls on deaf ears. What I realized is that you have to speak in a currency with which you know, medical institutions and administrators mm-hmm. will listen to, which is dollars and cents. Mm-hmm. And when you start to rack up the numbers regarding malpractice suits caused by insufficient yeah, sleep. Yeah, they start paying attention. They start paying attention, yeah. yeah. So I was just stupid. I, I, I thought about appealing in, in the wrong language. 